welcome back. We are changing gears to hear a bill introduction on H232. And with us is Representative Catherine Sims. And Catherine, I'm guessing Craftsbury, is that right? Good guess. Okay. Yeah. So um, welcome to General Housing Military Affairs. And um, this is a bill introduction, so you don't need to feel pressure to give us a line by line. We'll do that with an attorney when the attorneys, um, when we take this up further, if we take this off the wall further for an explanation. But um, just tell us why this bill, why now? Great, thank you so much. Yeah, Catherine Sims here from Grassberry, and um, thank you, Chair Stevens and the committee for your interest in H232 and opportunity to provide um, a very high level overview. Um, so this bill, I would say its core is about equity in access to land and homeownership. Um, all Vermonters deserve access to housing, well-paying jobs, a healthy environment and access to land. Unfortunately, as we all know, part of our history as a nation and as a state is a legacy of policies that have cut off Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, BIPOC, from land and homeownership. The stewardship of Vermont lands was removed from the Abenaki when Europeans made Vermont a state in 1791. And housing and lending discrimination through restrictive covenants, redlining, and other lending pra practices have prevented many black and brown folks from owning land or homes. In fact, here in Vermont, we have one of the widest homeownership gaps between black and white residents in the country, with 72% of white households and just 21% of black households owning their homes. Fortunately, though, here in Vermont, we have the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, which does really incredible work to increase access to affordable housing, farmland, jobs, and recreation assets for Vermonters. In FY19 uh, and 20, with a state investment of 31 million, VHCB leveraged 162 million in funding for affordable housing and land conservation. Um, VHCB granting and capacity build building programs have supported many diversity related activities over the years, including things like founding a multicultural center in Burlington's Old North End, the preservation of the Daisy Turner Homestead, part of the African American Heritage Trail in Grafton, grant writing assistance to the Clements Farm, and providing housing for BIPOC households, and really so many more incredible projects. And, this really important work addresses inequities in access and VHCB is really well positioned to further enhance BIPOC access to homes and lands, as well as support the education and capacity of other organizations seeking to do the same. And so this bill seeks to recognize the work that VHCB is doing by codifying their commitment to BIPOC land and home ownership access in their authorizing language and empowering the organization and its partners to continue to do more of this really vital work. And so the, the bill would do four key things. Um, in stating the purposes of the act, the bill would add ex, um, expanding access to land and home ownership to Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination or an equal access to benefits and services, including black, indigenous and people of color to VHCB's allocation priorities and eligible activities to codify VHC's commitment to this work. Um, second, the bill would also give greater voice to BIPOC Vermonters by creating two new seats on VHCB's board. In this bill, we propose sort of one way to add those seats based on our conversations with VHCB and others. It is certainly not written in stone that this is the only way to do this. And we hope, and you, we hope you'll take testimony from them and others about how to ensure that we get the right voices at the table. Um, third, the bill provides access um, to conserved land for Vermont recognized tribes to gather medicines, natural food and ceremonial materials. This is a small but I think important step towards recognizing traditional land rights and builds on agreements that the Abenaki have developed with um, Fish and Game and others. And lastly, the bill builds into VHCB's annual report some mechanisms to reflect and report on this work, including adding metrics to monitor progress um, in, in these areas. 
The bill language has been developed in consultation with VHCB, Vermont tribes, and others. Um, I've, I find the phrase nothing about us without us a really helpful reminder that policy decisions should be made with the full and direct participation of people affected by those decisions. And I hope that the committee can take the time to hear from a diverse range of witnesses that bring forward additional ideas and solutions about the work that is going on and yield a bill that um, has support support from those we're trying to impact um, in, with this work. I would note that there's some precedent for these kind of changes. In 2011, two changes were made to VHCB's eligible activities, one adding forest land and another adding conservation for multiple purposes, including water quality. These changes helped guide future investment that led to positive impacts. Um, and so, you know, overall, again, in sort of summary, this bill helps support and empower VHCB to continue the really important work that it's doing to promote land and home ownership access and economic opportunities for Vermonters who have historically suffered discrimination or unequal access. Basically, this bill helps people in real time build wealth. I also think it's important to note that these changes would be impactful beyond VHCB. The language makes clear to VHCB's network of partners across the state that this is important work around expanding access and it's something that um, all might be working towards. Um, I know that your committee has a bunch of other bills, important bills in the works like the eugenics apology, apology and the truth and reconciliation process. And I see this bill as a complement to that work and something that could easily be implemented right now to address racial equity. I know that all of our committees are really busy right now and I appreciate um, you taking the time to um, you know, uh, get this introduction and I look forward to following your conversations and discussions and seeing how you might refine this bill. And thanks so much, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer um, any questions uh, about the bill from the committee. Representative Kalecki. Thank you, hello, hello Representative Sims and welcome. Um, the governor and his uh, budget proposal did allocate resources uh, for a, a similar thing for home ownership for community. So does this complement that or is this on a parallel track or how, how do you see those two initiatives together or are they just completely separate? Yeah. I, I think this is all a, hopefully a part of an effort to um, kind of codify and to bake in a commitment to BIPOC access to important land and home ownership resources that help build wealth. And I think what's really important about this bill is, is baking that in into the allocation priorities and eligible activities. So it's not something that we do just once. It's, it's not something that we can do more of less of over time. It's stating because of the historical and the current and persistent challenges around land and homeownership access for um, BIPOC Vermonters that it is, it is baked in as a core commitment, a core part of our mission of how, how this organization, um, which plays a critical role as our housing and conservation hub across the state, that it's um, that commitment uh, is, is codified in, in language. And, and I think it aligns and supports the, you know, the initiative that you just spoke to and has a ripple effect um, into the future. So it's not just a one-time thing that we do, it's a part of how we operate. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, no, thank you for, for presenting this bill. There's a lot packed into it and um, you know, we look forward to a time when we will unpack it without um, trying to just throw throw it over our shoulders. Um, but this is this is. Um, I mean, I think that a little bit to John's point, to Representative Kalaki's point. You know, VHCB has always been an organization that has been um, addresses social needs, perhaps before some of the other agencies do, because they see it from this the lowest level you know from the demographic stage and um so working with this to try to you know emphasize this program we'll we'll take testimony from them certainly and um and see how that fits in with their current statute statutory mission representative bloomley thank you chair um <clears throat> i you know Full disclosure, uh, I'm a co-sponsor of this bill. So I'm kind of throwing you a softball. 
uh, Representative Sims, uh, to just because uh, I I, <clears throat> I think it would be helpful for all of us to hear why if, VAC, if, if BHCB is doing these things, then why is this bill necessary? Yeah, I, I think again, sort of, um, as I said to, to Representative Kalaki, um, they they are stepping into this work and, you know, listed a number of the really terrific projects that they're doing. Um, you know, I don't know if folks know about the Pine Island Community Farm. There's some really innovative efforts to increase access to land and home ownership that VHCB and its partners make possible. Um, and they would like to do more. And, you know, I, I think authorizing land use plays play such an important role in, um, again, codifying that commitment, authorizing the, the organization to prioritize this work, not just as an aside or an add-on or something to do more of one year and do less of another, but say, this is a part of our core principles. You know, words matter and um, baking this language into the mission along with its commitment to low-income Vermonters, along with its commitment to conservation of, of land um, and public access to recreation opportunities that ensuring that those who have been, who have experienced discrimination um, have access to these programs I, I think is vital and 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 naming that um, and and building it into their allocation priorities so that funding decisions can can flow from that I think is it is essential and helps this organization feel empowered to do more of the great work that it's really doing and I just would add that one of the things that we talked about is the fact that I mean leadership uh, can change and um, our government and administrative priorities can change. And this, um, this secures that commitment as enduring among, um, among its commitments. Well said, thank you. <laughs> All right, anything further for Representative Sims at this time? All right, see, not seeing any uh, representative Sims. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, welcome to our committee. Um, yeah, I can't wait until I can climb the stairs and see your your room in, in real life someday, I hope. But the commute was pretty easy today, so. Good, yeah, that's good. And um, no, and what with this just being a, a, a simple little walk, a simple little bill introduction, we've got our We've kept our curiosity caps on tight for for right now, but we'll have questions um, when we if we if and when we take this up soon um, after crossover. Great, and please uh, know I'm here and, and available in, in whatever way I can be useful as the, the conversations unfold. And thanks again for your, the, the time. Great, thank you. All right, let's move. Um, I have a hard stop at like four fifteen myself, um, if that seems long for people and you need to go to another meeting, just wave your hand or let me know in the chat. But um, um, let's go to Representative China, who's I presume is still here. There he is. Um, and Representative China is presenting H273 which is, um, I guess it's related to a degree, um, not directly, but it's related to a degree to H232 in subject matter, which would be land access of sorts. Um, but let me just pass the microphone over to Representative China for this bill introduction. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's strange to not be sneaking down the hallway and instead to be sneaking between a phone and a computer. Um, so thanks for letting me um, present today. So I'm going to share a screen um, and um, I like audio visual combinations. So I like doing little slideshows for people. So uh, it should be about seven minutes and then there'll be a little time for questions. I don't plan to keep you till 4.15. Um, but let's get this started. No, I want to make sure I share the right screen always my fear that you're going to see my to-do list. Um, so that should be working. So you that is not your to-do list. So no, well, it's one of the many things on the list, but um, so we have H273, an act relating to promoting racial and social equity in land access and property ownership. 
Um, and so I just, this is not a walkthrough, it's sort of like a summary high level of what the bill does. So we've got a legislative intent section. I am going to read this though, because this is sort of the pitch, the reason for the bill. Um, equal opportunity is a fundamental principle of American democracy. However, structural racism, defined as the laws, policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other societal norms that work together to deny equal opportunity, structural racism, has resulted in wealth disparities among Vermonters. Wealth disparities are a function of not only access to income, but also the ability to have access to the land and to property ownership. The foundation of our current economic system was built on land that was taken from Abenaki and other indigenous persons, and the structures of our economic system were constructed with the labor of enslaved persons. The legacy of settler colonialism and chattel slavery has been systemic racism and discrimination embedded into many aspects of our modern way of life on this land. The relationship between all persons in the land has been used to oppress persons over the past several centuries. The laws and policies of our state and nation severed indigenous persons from their land while denying them, black persons and other persons of color, from having the opportunity to access and to own land. In order to offer repair for the systemic discrimination faced by many persons throughout the state over the past four centuries, the state of Vermont must engage in a just transition to an economic system that systemically undoes racism instead of reinforcing it. Efforts to remedy wealth disparity in the United States have traditionally looked to the free market economy for solutions to the very problem that that economy has created. However, there has been increased recognition that improving access to land and property ownership will require broader approaches. In order to rectify this history of inequity, we must create opportunities for permanent land access in every town in Vermont through collective and individual land ownership options using new systems that empower and center Vermonters who have, been, who have historically suffered from discrimination. And something else that's in our intent section that's not in the presentation that I think is relevant is it says that this isn't enough, that we actually need to go further and we need to engage in processes of truth and reconciliation. And I say that because what this bill seeks to do is create a pathway for people to have the opportunity that others have had in the existing system, but it doesn't address what led to the existing system. It doesn't address the underlying wounds. And we, this is an important step in the right direction, but giving indigenous people grants to buy houses doesn't address the fact that indigenous land was taken and unseated and that, that you know, those, the actions of colonization have harmed people in more ways than just depriving them to own a home. And so um, I, I have more to say on that issue that I'm not going to get into now, but it is this bill does mention that in its legislative intent. So I'm not going to review the findings with you today because they're extensive. I'm just going to show you citations for the findings. And you can go look into these on your own if you wish, or if you take up the bill, we can have, have some people come in to testify. We do have a we do have a written finding section that you can also read, but this is the source of the findings. You can see there's extensive findings backing why this is a problem, ranging from um, various articles, um, various um, state reports, um, studies, um, you know, actions of the state, like there's a, there's a uh, Burlington City Resolution in here. Um, so you can see, um, just take a look at that, digest it for a second, that there's a lot of, inform there's a lot of information backing um, the problem here. There's a lot of data supporting that there's a problem here. And we need to do something about it. So the purpose of the act is to invest in individual and collective land access and property ownership as a way to move towards greater racial and social equity in wealth distribution. And we do this by creating a Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Fund in the state treasury, which will consist of money appropriated by the General Assembly and any other funds provided by public or private sources. And this fund will be administered by the Vermont Land Access and Opportunity Board. This is the membership of the board. I'm not going to read you the whole bill and all the details about, you know, the, the sort of housekeeping stuff about a board. You know, that all that stuff is in there. But this is just the membership to get you an idea. And this is important because 
Um, I developed this bill in partnership um, with, with a group called Seeding Power Vermont. And Seeding Power Vermont is interested in doing um, sort of transformative work. Um, and one of the pieces is that too often the decisions are made not by those who are impacted. So we wanted this, the state to say there was going to be a board with some independence to decide where this money should go. And so you can see here, um, the membership of the board reflects that because you have, you have some people appointed by state agencies, you know, for example, we have the racial equity director or designee, we have someone with financial expertise by commerce and community development, someone with real estate expertise, you can see, or farming expertise by a state agency. But then you see external groups being given the power to appoint members who represent different populations who have been historically impacted um, by the legacy of colonization and slavery. Um, and you also see LGBTQ, an organization um, with LGBTQ people. So. Um, just sharing that because a big, a big um, sort of thing that uh, distinct piece of this bill is this idea that we are empowering as the legislature. We are giving power to an independent board to make financial decisions for the communities they represent. And that's different than giving money to another state agency that's most likely going to be predominantly white um, making those decisions for BIPOC. So the powers and duties are important and there's a bunch. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to read word for word, but giving grants for pr purchasing a primary residence, giving grants for purchasing a farm or land deemed suitable for regenerative practices, awarding grants for land access and stewardship programs, funding financial education and wealth management programs, um, retaining financial advisors to assist the board and its grantees um, so that they, they can... Um, manage their the investment you know manage that property manage that investment um, that the state is making um, the uh, grants to anti-racist mutual aid networks and the reason we have this is that black indigenous and other people of color can't always rely on the support networks of society that grew out of white supremacy and if you know if, if you heard testimony from some bipoc who come from different parts of the state, you would hear a wide range of stories about the support that people get from their community um, institutions such as the police. And so if we're going to um, give people money to buy a home in a community where they don't aren't going to have equal access to support, we should also be funding mutual aid networks to, to sort of spring up to support people in alternative ways. And really, it's an important piece um, to have anti-racist mutual aid helping people to help each other. Um, Grants to groups who want to share land or create commons or have collective ownership. Also, we have grant funds to the Every Town Project. Um, we, if you'd like, we can have Every Town come in and talk about the work they're doing. This is not the Every Town with the gun control. This is Every Town, a Vermont-based group that is looking at um, how to create land access and stewardship in every town in Vermont for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, the board shall also work with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency to explore ways to use grants um, to mortgage subsidies and um, other ways to overcome barriers to obtaining a mortgage. So really looking at what are some of the issues that have prevented BIPOC from getting mortgages in the past. And this could include redlining or algorithmic systems that are being used these days to make decisions. Um, and last but not least, working with the Vermont Tax uh, Department of Taxes to look at tax incentives or breaks um, for those properties to help people succeed. Um, there's, it talks about um, eligibility in the, in, the, in the bill, and I think this is important that that board will have the authority to adopt rules concerning eligibility. Um, and these, could, th these shall include income guidelines, limits on the amount of grants, rules governing the transfer of these properties, generational poverty, inheritance, you know, just looking at these pieces and adopting rules. And then um, the board shall allocate grants to achieve a balanced, healthy mix of both private and collective ownership so that the intent is that all the money won't go to one kind of thing but that it's being spread out and we're experimenting with different types of access and ownership. We put in a, pro a proposed appropriation that's pretty large um, considering our financial situation. You could think of it as a placeholder 
wishful thinking, you know, that $10 million, if the state put $10 million in a fund and let this board invest that money over the next few years, it would make a significant dent in wealth disparity. And so we put a, a meaningful number, but we are also understanding that there are limits. And so, you know, the committee would probably want to take some testimony on what's a more realistic appropriation. And then you'd probably send the bill to appropriations and they would change that anyway. Um, and then last but not least, we have the effective date. So I tried to do that in seven minutes. It was a little longer. Um, but I sent you all the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions um, at this point. All right, questions for Representative China. Um, thank you for coming in. I think it's a. Um, I th I think it's an audacious bill, in a good way. I mean, it's really challenging us through its findings to um, address some of the many things that are being covered in conversation or through policy throughout the committees. Um, I have yet to read the whole series of findings, but um, I appreciate you sending us these slides, but that won't, that really won't um, take the place of reading through the findings. Um, and, you know, as we've said with the previous bill, you know, we, we will get a walkthrough in due course, um, though you just did a great introduction to it. So <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like there's more to be heard, but then, um, you yeah, know, this was pretty thorough. Um, um, one thing I will say is that I, it's, I can't emphasize enough that this bill was created in partnership with black and indigenous leaders um, and that, th that, that we've spent hours and hours over the last few months um, trying to think of the best way to take action to address this problem. And that um, I could not do justice to their story. And so if there was an opportunity to bring um, the core group in and give them some time to sh present um, their rationale for this work and just some of the work they do as individuals in the community and the different groups they're part of in the community, um, it you know, it would be helpful, even if this bill wasn't ultimately something you acted on, it may influence your other decisions. Um, so I just would like to put that out there that I think, you know, I can't emphasize enough that this is a, a collaboration with a larger group of people, of impacted people, and that their voices um, are important in this discussion. Um, and that I, as much as I am the lead sponsor, that my voice could not substitute for theirs. So I just want to emphasize that. Thank you. No, and we'll we'll contact you for those contacts, um, or you can simply provide them to Ron to keep on to keep on um, on his computer. Thank you. All right. Anything else for Representative China? Well, thank you for being in our committee all afternoon. Oh, Representative Kalaki. But, but Brian, thank you for being in our committee. It's, um, I hope it was a small respite from, from uh, your usual easygoing health insurance care work. Um, I was listening to both at once, actually. And you're still here. That's amazing. It's like they're right there on the phone. Like I could show you, but um, I, I'm not listening to them now, but I was listening to both. So it wasn't really a respite. It was actually like this stressful um, attempt at, at multitasking, but we got through it. I'm not sure respite is anything but a code word for boy. I wish I was on an island someplace that's not in between your phone and your computer. Um, right? Just that's, I'm not sure when we'll get a, a respite. Res Representative Kalaki. Well, thank you, Representative Gina, for being here and for this bill. But I also would love to invite you to send any feedback you have on the other bill, because you were a co-sponsor for us to create this task force for the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee and the structure that is a, our beginning structure from last session is what we're going to be starting with. And so if um, you could, any input from you or reactions would be very welcome if, you know, I would like to 
benefit from the work you do. Uh, and because this is a very important thing for the legislature to move forward. And I want to take this very seriously. So. Well, I'm happy to share those thoughts. I, I, I don't think now is a great time um, to get into it because we got, we're, the other witnesses aren't here. But I do have some very specific suggestions and ideas around that. So I'm happy to talk with committee members offline um, or to come back another day for five minutes and just say, hey, I've been working on this for a while and here's what I'm hearing from people. So I would, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Representative Chin. I appreciate it. We are burned out from a very long day of testimonialism. Um, but this is, I'm glad to get this in, um, get this introduction in. And um, I guess they'll, we'll do that classic thing and just say, we'll be in touch. Um, but we'll let you know when we're, when we're um, able to follow up. All right, thank you. Um, and committee, that was a long day, a lot of, a lot of information today. Um, we started off with, we started off with a rental housing and safety bill. That seems like yesterday already. Um, so let's call it a day. And we will be back at it tomorrow morning. We have um, another long list of testimony on JRH2. And, um, and probably pick up some more testimony on H96 as well in the morning. But we'll see how that goes. But I... And then, and then we have some time after the re results of the votes for um, some bill, for some palate cleansing bill introductions on liquor. So it'll be a spirited conversation. Ooh, remind me to draft <laughs> you for my pun team. Uh, All right, that's. Um,